Thanks, Alan. Well, I'm, I plan my next book to be about the economic role of the financial sector, and I was hoping that there might be quite a good sale for that in Dublin. <laughs> it's certainly a place I should... Uh, I'm very pleased, actually, to visit in the course of uh, working on this. Uh, but I also visit Wall Street and the City of London and Canary Wharf and the great financial centres of the world. And if you walk around them and you see the lights burning late into the night, most people outside the financial services sector and quite a number of people in it must have asked from time to time, you know, what do all these people actually do? What's it all about? Well, to an extraordinary extent, what's it, what is it, it's all about is about trading with each other. Let me illustrate, give you one or two figures that simply illustrate that. Uh, we obviously need to have trading in foreign exchange in order to make trade in goods and services possible. But the volume of trading in foreign exchange is something like 70 times the volume of trading in goods and services. That is, for every occasion on which someone needs to buy dollars and sell yen in order to effect a, a business transaction, there are 70 financial transactions going on around about that. The total volume of outstanding derivative contracts is currently estimated by the Bank of International Settlements to be something like six, between six and seven hundred trillion dollars. That's about six or seven times the total national income of the world. Uh, and of course that's not the value of the assets on which, to which the derivative contracts relate, it's the value of the contracts themselves. We have the growth of high frequency trading, which is estimated now to account for getting on for around about two thirds of the volume of all trading on the New York Exchange and something like half of trading in London. High frequency trading, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is people lodging orders, most of which are not actually fulfilled, but when they are fulfilled, typically selling. Um, holding the securities that are bought for extraordinarily short periods of time and lodging orders for lengths of time that may be measured in fractions of a second. That it matters how close your computer is to the exchange computers because the interval that uh, it takes for data to travel along fiber optic cables even from the exchange's computer to your computer actually may make a difference, a fundamental difference, to the profitability of trading. So that exchanges now sell what they call co-location, which is having your, your computer right close by. High frequency trading produced what was known as the flash, flash crash a couple of years ago, where the value of a whole variety of stocks and I quoted in New York, went crazy. Some of them were quoted at, in large companies, were quoted at zero for a few minutes, for example. The most scary thing about that flash crash is that people still don't really understand how it happened. Uh, it was, as it were, computers going berserk. And it came under control again when, in effect, people unplugged the computers and uh, went back to to kind of manual trading. Perhaps more seriously still, if I look at the balance sheets today of UK banks, they total about seven trillion pounds. That's quite a lot, it's about four times British national income. But if you ask what proportion of that turns out to be lending to real non-financial businesses, the answer is it's about 200 billion, or about 3% of the total. If you ask what these assets and liabilities are, <clears throat> the answer in the, in the main is that they're the same. 
in the sense that the assets are mainly the liabilities of other banks and the liabilities are mainly the assets of other banks. So what is all this for? It's a question I, I always like the rhyme that Humboldt Wolf wrote a best part of a hundred years ago that said, in the city they sell and buy and nobody ever asks them why. But since it contents them to buy and sell, God forgive them, they might as well. <laughs> but actually if the consequences of doing them are, as people in this room know, to the, in most cases, substantial personal cost, that this is to be paid for by the public at large, we need to ask more penetrating questions about it than Humbert Wolf did. There's also, if one starts to think of it in these ways, an even more basic question to be asked. Suppose we have an activity that consists very largely of people shuffling bits of paper back and forwards to each other. There's a common sense that suggests that people shuffling the same bits of paper back and forwards to each other can't either add very much value or make very large amounts of profit out of the process. If this activity is really the way we're describing, how on earth is it so profitable? Why is it that financial services businesses appear to make so, so much money, and why is it that people in financial services businesses earn so much? Having posed these questions from one perspective, I now want to look at the industry from another, which is to ask, what do we really want the financial sector to do? Well, I think the financial sector, well, it's obvious that Real economies need financial services. It's very clear that uh, a part, large part of the reason why poor countries remain poor is that they have very underdeveloped financial services sectors. And to get to reasonable stages of development, we need financial services. We need financial services, I think, to do at least four things. We need financial services to provide the payment system to enable us to receive our wages and salaries, to pay our bills, and so on. And both individuals and businesses need financial services to operate a payment system. That's essentially a utility like gas and electricity and telecommunications and, and water. It's one of these basic core infrastructures of the economy and if it stops functioning for more than a few hours, in fact, uh, the economy grinds to a halt. Although Ireland is often quoted as the most powerful counterexample to that as a result of the Irish bank strike of the, of the 1970s in which the banking system closed down and the economy continued to function. It's not clear whether that could happen in quite the same way now. It's an interesting question. The second thing that the financial services sector does is capital allocation. It gets money from uh, particularly uh, uh, people who were to businesses who need it from people who saved it. But as I've already indicated, the amounts which are involved certainly in getting it to businesses that need it are really very small relative to the size of the financial services sector. Uh, that's not the main part of what banks do. And actually much the largest part of what banks do in terms of lending to the real economy turns out to be residential mortgages, helping people to buy their houses. That accounts for about two-thirds of bank lending to the real economy in countries like Britain and Ireland. Now, that's very important, but in truth, lending in residential mortgages is not very difficult. It's something that was done quite well 20 years ago in both our countries by building society managers who were typically people who had left school at 16 or 17 and worked their way up in rather simple financial organizations. 
And interestingly, it seems they did it rather better than the computer scorers and rating agencies and smart guys with MBAs who took over these businesses for them. Third thing we need is we need uh, financial services to help us manage our personal finances. Most of us go through life and we have phases when we spend more than we earn and phases when we earn more than we spend. And if we manage this, these things well, we try and roughly even them out over our lifetime. And we need institutions to help us in, in doing that. And we have savings markets that provide these opportunities, although actually the returns on these savings markets have been really rather disappointing over the last decade or so. And uh, it turns out that a rather large proportion of the returns which have been earned have been absorbed by increasingly large costs of intermediation before they actually go to savers. And the final thing that uh, the financial services system needs to do for the real economy, and actually the one which is most talked about if you talk about, if you raise the question of um, financial innovation over the last two decades, is risk management. What has financial innovation been about? It's been about enabling us to manage risk better. If I were, uh, went out into a Connell Street and asked people, do you think the world has become more or less risky as a result of financial innovation over the last two decades, people would think I had taken leave of my senses. Um, what on earth do, they, do people mean when they talk about that? The rather curious thing when you get down to it is that what is meant by risk management is actually the management of risks that were created within the financial sector itself. That is the set of risks that the very sophisticated tools which have been developed within the sector have been designed to handle. They have not done anything positive. Indeed, we understand some of the negative things they've done to manage the risks which are faced in everyday life by ordinary people, the risks which are basically to do with ill health and premature death, the risks that are to do with relationship breakdown, the risks that are to do with redundancy and unemployment. These are the kind of risks that would worry people out there in McConnell Street, and they're risks which, insofar as they're dealt with at all, are dealt with by social institutions. These are the things, then, that we need the financial services sector to do, to provide a payment system, to enable us to do capital allocation, to manage our personal finances, and to help us manage risk. If you look at that list, I'd like you to notice three things about it. Firstly, it's quite modest. It's, uh, it's important, but most of them are quite simple things that can be done by relatively limited uh, organisations. The second thing is they're not currently done terribly well. Not any of them done terribly well. And perhaps the most important uh, uh, of them, uh, capital allocation, is done, I think, particularly badly. Large firms today in Britain and Ireland and most of the developed world are essentially self-financing. They generate more cash from operations than they actually invest. Small firms uh, uh, need seed capital no longer in the same way as they once did to cover plant and machinery. Because the truth is one of the things of the growth of what we all think about as the knowledge economy is businesses just need less capital than they did. But new businesses badly need capital to fund the operating losses of developing new businesses and new ideas. And that's something our capital markets don't provide very well. Personal finance, I've criticized, and risk management, actually. Financial institutions help with a few things, like the risk of a car accident or certain kinds of life insurance but not very much or very fundamentally. They're not done very well. But most of all, 
they're not things, any of them, they're not things that need people who are paid telephone number salaries. What people who are paid telephone number salaries are doing is the business I described earlier of trading in existing assets or of supervising people who are trading in existing assets. And that brings us to the question I posed earlier. If they're so busy trading with each other, where does all the money come from that they make out of it? Well, that's an interesting question that has worried me for quite a long time. One of the first times at which it started to worry me was when I sat on the board in the 1990s of what was then the Halifax Building Society, which converted to become a public limited company and became, in that sense, a bank. But uh, in my view, the, the road to nemesis for that particular organization began not when it converted its uh, organizational form, but on the day when it was decided that the treasury operation, which had basically historically existed, as a service department for the funding requirements of the bank, should become a profit center in its own right. Proper banks made money out of, uh, uh, out of trading and debt in various ways, and so should we. And I asked the question when I saw the numbers for the profits that were anticipated from this operation, I asked the question, who is going to lose the money that we are going to make out of this operation? It seemed to me an obvious question since the, the value of fixed interest securities is essentially fixed. Anyway, the reaction was as though I'd made a rather rude noise. <laughs> and uh, I was sent off to um, be educated by the traders into how they would make this money. I'm bound to say I didn't feel very much wiser at the end of the day and I didn't find it a particularly enjoyable day in any sense, or feel impressed by the intelligence or acumen of the people who were involved. And I went on kind of worrying about that question. Now, you may think that the fact that the organization collapsed in 2008 and was rescued by the British government perhaps gives a partial answer to my question. And I think, fundamentally, it does. Because part of the answer to the, my question, and the one which I, I want to focus on right now, is the one that says the explanation of the, of the profitability of this activity is that perhaps it isn't all that profitable. Perhaps the common sense that suggests that people exchanging bits of paper with each other won't make very much money out of it is right that the apparent the profitability is, in this sense, more apparent than real. Uh, Nicholas Nassim Taleb, I thought, put it quite well in describing the years from 2003 to 2007. And it's a way that will, I think, reson uh, a, fr a way of framing it that will resonate, I think, rather strongly with an Irish audience. It says, we borrowed a lot of money from the future, and then the future came. <laughs> And uh, I, I, I recall a striking presentation in Ireland in which an accountant took um, two, the accounts of a series of years of two failed Irish companies. One was Waterford Wedgwood, and he showed how for that business, profits gradually declined until they became negative and eventually the business disappeared. And the other was, of course, Anglo-Irish Bank, where what, uh, what the equivalent graph showed was rapidly increasing year-on-year -year profits every year until uh, suddenly it made the largest loss of any organization in, in Irish history or indeed the history of uh, most of Western Europe. There was clearly something wrong of a measurement of the so-called profits in that particular case. And this is a general problem. Uh, again, in a way that will be familiar to the, an Irish audience, I think, 
I was always impressed when John Kenneth Galbraith's book about the Great Crash talked about the bezel. And the bezel is the amount by which the world is better off after a thief has stolen something, but before the people from whom he's stolen it have discovered that the money has gone. <laughs> and Charlie Munger, who is uh, Warren Buffett's partner, has talked of the fee bezel. It doesn't have the same ring in the phrase as the functionally equivalent bezel. And I think you in Ireland were, were uh, victims of one of the largest functionally equivalent bezels in history. Uh, where do these kind of mechanisms come from? Well, let me give you three illustrations of how people can think themselves rich and have done so in the financial sector. The simplest, of course, is the Ponzi scheme. That is the scheme by which you pay high returns to early investors in a project from the suckers who are attracted by these high returns to come into the business later. And of course, we've just heard of Bernie Madoff, who ran the biggest illegal Ponzi scheme in history. But there are, of course, plenty legal Ponzi schemes around. We have, if we ask each other, ourselves how we can create wealth by passing around the same bits of paper to each other, then it's very easy. We start at one end of the room. You sell a bit of paper for a euro to the person sitting next to you who sells it for two euros to uh, the person next, for three euros and so on. And everyone in the room has made, a, uh, or quite a lot of people in the room have made a euro profit, there is, of course, somebody in the room who will be landed with a bit of paper when people notice it wasn't any more valuable to, at the moment than it was to begin with, but that may be quite a long way off. And, of course, these legal Ponzi schemes were what happened uh, in the, the new economy bubble or, indeed, to a large degree in the Irish property boom. So we can have the, we can have the Ponzi scheme, this process, of selling essentially the same assets to each other at higher and higher prices. It's a bubble that will burst one day, but that day may be quite some way away, and people will report quite large profits in the course of doing so. A second kind of device for thinking yourself rich I'd like to describe is the martingale strategy. Now, the martingale is a very old and familiar betting strategy, and the rule of the martingale is every time you lose, you increase your stakes to the point at which on the next throw of the coin, horse, or whatever it might be, you will win enough money to more than recoup all your existing losses. You keep, as it were, doubling your stakes in every successive game. Now, there are two well-known and seemingly contradictory properties of of martingales. One is that if you keep playing the strategy for long enough, you are bound to win. And the other is if you play the strategy often enough, you are certain to be ruined one day. <laughs> and uh, the apparent contradiction between these two observations is something which has engaged people for, for several centuries. The martingale is another strategy in this area. It's the strategy of which every rogue trader who is finally exposed by some appalled bank has been guilty. But of course, the people who are exposed by the appalled banks are the people for whom the ruin actually arrived, and there are quite a lot of people for whom the ruin actually doesn't arrive. Of course, I think there's a particular interest in the Martingale strategy because it seems to me that the managers of the Eurozone are today engaged in what is probably the largest Martingale strategy game in the history of, uh, in the history of this kind of betting. The strategy of every time you lose, doubling up your bet in order in the hope of recouping all that you have already got, lost. Third strategy is what I call tailgating, and I call it tailgating because I spend a lot of time nowadays 
in the south of France, where I drive on motorways. And you'll know if you do that, you're endlessly tailgated by people who flash their lights as, you, uh, uh, as they drive a meter or so from your rear bumper. Um, now, the interesting thing about tailgating is that it's a strategy that pays 99.9% .9 of the time. You move over, and the person who tailgates you gets to his destination a minute or so quicker than he otherwise would, and he congratulates himself on his skillful driving. Sometimes, of course, tailgating doesn't pay. It, uh, consequences are often disastrous when it doesn't pay, but they're infrequent, and when it does occur, uh, people, there is a kind of cognitive dissonance that dissociates the consequences from their behavior. Uh, people say to themselves, and they say to themselves often with some justification, that it wasn't my tailgating driving that caused the accident. It was the obstruction on the road that led the person in front of me to break. It was the unexpected blowout on the part of the car in front. It was some proximate cause that gave rise to the, the particular accident. But of course, it is inevitable that these kind of strategies will blow up from time to time. And a lot of what people in the, in the sector call carry trades are essentially transactions that have this tailgating property. They pay most of the time, but occasionally they, live, they, they lose, and they lose disastrously. But strategies that have that property have the characteristic that people who engage in them congratulate themselves and are congratulated by their superiors on their acumen, and that puts pressure on other people as it does on people who don't drive badly on French auto routes to imitate the behavior of the people who are engaging it in, in, in it in the first place. I've simply taken illustrations of three broad types of strategies. I have three or four more, which I'm not going to bore you with uh, uh, at lunchtime today. But I simply want to illustrate the ways in which it's possible for people to imagine that activities are more profitable than they, in fact, will turn out to be in the long run. And I think what we've seen as a result of so-called innovation in the financial services sector is, uh, is the world in which these strategies have come to the fore. What should we do about it? Well, I'm going to need longer than I have today. Uh, to, to, to run through that. I think if you've understood what I've been saying about the way these kind of problems and activities are embedded in the structure of the industry it has, as it has developed, you will understand why it is that I believe that we're not going to tackle these issues by creating you know, ever more detailed behavioral rules you know, one only has to say that the so-called Basel III rules on capital regulation and requirements for banks run to several hundred pages. I think one just has to say that to understand why this is not going to work in terms of, of stopping the kind of behaviors which I've been describing, or indeed giving ourselves a financial system which secures the kind of stability we, we all want for it. I think our remedies have to, uh, have to have much more to do with structural reform. Structural reform that goes back to the idea that we move away from financial conglomerates and have activities done, financial activities done in separate silos. We need simpler activities that have less complicated interconnections with each other. We need to ensure that high-risk activities, some of which we need to make the financial sector function, are undertaken either in partnership-type structures or in hedge fund-type environments where there's a close relationship between the people who are managing the money and the people who are, who are providing the money. <coughs> 
we should not have these kind of activities embedded in wide-ranging <coughs> financial conglomerates, and so on. We should be addressing issues to do with the structure of the industry and the structure of regulation and stop believing that we are going to find uh, train regulators who are incapable even of catching a crude crook like Bernie Madoff, that we will train them to be people who will successfully second guess the risk management strategies of Goldman Sachs. You know, anyone who believes that has no understanding of the realities of what regulation means on the ground. But above all, we need both inside and outside the financial services sector to understand that we've lived through a decade in which the financial sector has not performed the basic tasks which I was describing very well, in which taxpayers have had to put very large amounts of money into the system, in which savers have done pretty badly, and in which a lot of people who work in the sector have made a great deal of money. And I think one only has to describe that outcome to recognize that it's a, not a situation which is either which is sustainable either politically or economically. And if we don't address it in some more serious way, we, we risk problems that will jeopardize not just our economic stability, but our political stability as well. Thank you.